Let's put your shoes on, okay? Hey, I'm Nicola. Hi, I'm Hugh. And we're going to talk about our Australian bushfire experience. So for those that follow like our Instagram and the Twitter, uh, you would know that we escaped from the Australian fires. Um, but for people that are maybe just subscribed here and not following us other places, they won't necessarily know about it. So we've got footage and stuff and we're going to talk about our experience. I wanted to do a really like well done video and take you through it and be really coherent. Um, but I just can't at the moment. I'm still dealing with sort of having gone through that situation. I don't sleep at night. I don't know how you're sleeping. Are you okay? You're okay? Yeah, I sleep well. <laughs> you sleep well? i dealing with some after stress of it. So I usually wake up at about 1am and I feel like it's the morning, but it's not. But uh, my body just keeps waking up through the night. I've got some like stress rash and, and um, that type of thing. But I do want to say that our experience is not as bad as a lot of other people's. So we have a platform to share. So we're sharing it. Um, so I hope that then also people can hear more about other people's experience as well, especially people that don't know what's happening in Australia at the moment. It's terrible, really oh. terrible. It was really bad it was, uh, bushfire. Like everywhere. Like I, to even explain what is happening, there's just so much stuff. So I'll try and go through our experience first. And people and I wanted yeah. to say, mm. people say like, why you there? You went there if it was dangerous. No, it wasn't dangerous, dangerous when, when we, we went, went there. there. Yeah. So Australia has bushfires every year, but they have never been like this. This is unprecedented. Uh, it is just cr crazy, crazy. There's been drought for years. Uh, so basically, this is climate change. This is the beginning of how the world is changing because of climate change, and it is terrifying it is terrifying so australia has been in drought for years and this causes the bushfires to be so much more extreme um and they would just i i'll we'll just go through our experience and we can talk more um about that later for those that don't know we live in korea so we're an intercultural couple and we actually live in korea but every year we try to come back to australia for christmas around this time with my family and we go down the coast and uh, we have a beach Christmas there. So that was our normal plan. And we knew that this bushfire season was going to be worse than the others. But Australia is a big country, so you don't think that there's necessarily going to be bushfire exactly where you are. Um, we flew into Sydney and there's a, a lot of smoke. And this is the ridiculous thing. Like in Korea, we have a lot of bad air days and you deal with it and you have air purifiers. You come to Australia expecting clean air all the time. Australia doesn't have clean air anymore. It's no longer our, our refuge of going and clear skies and clear air. Um, and that the smoke from the bushfires is affecting other countries now, which is ridiculous. So we flew into a hazy Sydney and our plan was to immediately travel down the coast with my brother and sister to where the holiday house is where my parents already were. And we couldn't because the roads were closed that day because of fires. Um, but that in itself is still not that unusual, like that happens sometimes. So we knew the bushfires were going to be worse. Also, bushfires, wildfires, um, overseas people will call them wildfires or forest fires or that type of thing. But we use the term bushfires in, in um, Australia. Um, so we had to delay going down the coast for one day. Um, we got down the coast and things had sort of cleared up there. There wasn't really that much smoke. On the beach, there was a lot of burnt leaves, though. Mm. And we might talk about that in a different video because it's sort of too much to go into now, but we'll show you a little bit of footage of that now. But for that week, sort of over Christmas, things were fine. It still felt like a normal Christmas. When we were travelling down, I could see how much drier the, the land was, though. Normally, this is a very fertile area. It doesn't get that hot there. Usually, the temperatures are you know, in the teens and 20s, even in summer. And it was so dry. I'd never seen it like this. So you could already see the changes, the way that everything was changing. Um, but we had a, a week down there and things were pretty normal. There was evidence of the bushfires and that type of thing. Even before um, New Year's Eve, mm. it was okay because yeah. we saw the blue sky and yeah. everything. Yeah. And, you know, 
the weather became really good and uh, we saw the sun and mm. wow this is really good so we, we went swimming and yeah. everything was so good mm. and then new year's eve Same. after um lunch time mm. there's really strong wind yeah So we went to the beach with you yeah. and we had to leave really quickly because it was it hot. Very hot. So it was really hot but so windy. Normally down this part of the coast, and this is why a lot of Australians go down the south coast of New South Wales, the weather is not that hot. Um, where other places of Australia can be so, so hot and it's getting, getting hotter. But most of the time you're waiting for it to get warm enough to go to the beach down there. But this day it was suddenly so hot and there was a hot wind and we just left the beach because the sand was going everywhere and I remember saying like being in a really kind of crappy mood and being like oh 2019 is just going to give us one more miserable day before it goes out I had no idea how bad things were going to get after that I was complaining about a bit of wind on the beach like it was hot and it was windy we went back and it got hotter and hotter and then the power went out yeah I remember I was looking at my phone thinking I should charge my phone, you know, and then without warning, the power had gone out. And this was because bushfires had ripped through an area that are vital um, power lines and that. Um, and even though we were checking the news all the time, this we had really didn't have any warning of what was what was about to happen. Suddenly we got a message from the New South Wales government or something. The, the fire they, brigade. Yeah, so warning about things. And then after that, everything's gone. Like power gone. No internet, no, no power. No internet, no power, nothing. And then the fire cars, fire, the fire trucks, trucks were yeah, they just going start going past, mm. and suddenly the the uh, sky you know, turned to mm. kind of like really red, dark. like it was like red, really dark, but dark, yeah, red dark. But it was like middle of day, middle of the day. So right now we don't have any power at the holiday house um, and it's really strong winds. The temperature's dropping which is good but there's two fires and we're just waiting to see whether they're coming. Yeah, coming this way or not. I can't really show but it's really uh, dark and burning this side and the uh, fire is like really orange and yellow up there. Smoke is. So if something happens, we just run. Yeah, emergency plan is just to go straight down to the beach. And this uh, New Year's Eve. Yeah, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> You've got no idea what's happening, do you? And my parents were no longer there. So we were, my other siblings had like already left and it, w it was just us in a holiday house with my parents. But my parents had gone out that morning to go like a little bit up the coast to go to a New Year's Eve party with friends. And after they'd left, the roads closed. So suddenly we were actually trapped there. We didn't have a car. So suddenly we have no power, we have no internet, we have no phone reception, um, and everything is suddenly changing like that. Oh 
Oh my god, so it's very close. Let's put your shoes on, okay? I talked to some of the neighbors at that point, like checking everybody's power is out. They said it's out everywhere. The fire had actually come really, really close. And we sort of hadn't even realized at, at that point, um, but there was the wind switched suddenly. Yeah. So it was bearing down on us. Um, but then the neighbor who knew, who had more experience than us had no, the wind's now changed and it's going back this way, but there were still fires everywhere around us. So in that situation, you're, emergency plan is to just take a backpack and to get down to the beach so these are little coastal towns and they're surrounded by bushland and then there's always the beach or the lake there and so our emergency plan so we packed up our bags and everything was to just head straight down to the beach and you'll see in other areas of a uh, of australia this is what people actually had to do and you can see footage of people and children in the water because it's the only place um, that you can get away from the fire because if all the bushland around you is burning and all the houses are burning you've got nowhere to go so that was our plan of, es of escape so we pack all our stuff just in case and then our backpack ready um, if there's something like a fire just coming here then we um, just take the, our backpack and then just run and with you Then the temperature actually started to drop, right? So it seemed like we were safe at that point. Uh, things had changed, the temper had, temperature had dropped and those fires that were coming towards us didn't seem to be coming like that. So we were sort of just sitting around and waiting. And all, all through this, we were very calm because you, there's not much you can do in this situation. You just have your plan of escape um, and that's it. Um, in the evening, I went to see if I could find any phone reception or, or internet and a lot of people were outside of their houses and there's like a caravan park there because, you know, it's holiday, holiday town. And so I knew that a lot of people were stuck there as well. People had been diverted that way and these areas are all dead ends. So there'll be the main highway that goes down the south coast and then little roads go off it to these little towns. You don't, you can't go through the town to anywhere else like the town is just like a dead end there so people have been directed there and we're, we're stuck there so i went and i was talking to a few people and the sun was uh dropping and it was getting dark and i realized i could see all the fires on the horizon and then i realized behind our house how close they actually were in the bushland there So I hurried home and I came and I was like, we need to be ready to go. Packed everything. So I'm, I was ready if something happened. Just hold the ear and mm. take the backpack. We're going to put him in the carrier just and just run um, like that. So through the bushland, we could see the orange, the reddish orange like that. And the fire trucks were going out. So we're on the edge of the bushland and we could see the fire trucks go out. Now, I want to make this very... Uh, clear here these are volunteers so this is the rural like fire service brigade 
and they're all volunteers because the government has not put in a government agency to deal with this type of thing and this is one of the one of the very many reasons why people are very very upset with the government and so for our little area I there were guys that are obviously older than 60 like guys with gray hair and then there was like a boy that looked like he was 16 or something I don't know what the age is that you sign up but it looked very very young and then there was a woman as well no like men and women in their peak doing this it's all volunteers and I know a few other towns like over their brigade all men over 60 so when people talk about being underfunded and this type of thing and the anger about it this is one of the reasons you go into like any cafe down the south coast or in rural areas and they have donation boxes for these rural fire brigades and when you're giving money to support these which is like a good thing but that's money the government should be giving you're doing the government's job of paying these understaffed underfunded brigades a lot of them don't even have like the proper equipment and that type of stuff and they've been begging the government for this and ex-fire chiefs um i can put news articles on and show you have been begging for more equipment and more things and they they rely on fundraisers and now you have this bushfire season that was predicted to be awful and they're underprepared and they're understaffed and so we would see them they would do they, they had two trucks and they would do a stopover they would do a stopover and like sort of the front of where the holiday house was and i would see them doing that and i actually just cried at one moment because i could see who was going out to fight and the trucks look so small and these guys that are doing it for hours and hours on end and just it makes me so angry what an awful country and this is why people are so upset and i don't want to get too distracted because i'm just trying to tell our story at the moment um and so you would see the, the again be talking about you know not having the resources or and not having the equipment the helicopters going across and their buckets look so small and the seaplanes would be going and they would be filling up the things like this there was none like i know the things with the california fires and that and they were way more prepared and they had all this equipment and we don't here we didn't have it and so we were right there and the fires are coming towards us and you could see the lack of resources and it's heartbreaking so when I realized the fires were still coming towards us, um, and it's, it's dark by this time and there's no power. Everybody's just got candles. Um, and for food, we had to use the barbecue to try and, even though you're supposed to not use the barbecue, it's the, you know, fire restrictions um, everywhere. We had to use the barbecue to cook some food. We didn't have a generator or anything like that. Other people had some generators and that, but it was dark everywhere except for the glow on the horizon of the fires approaching. Um, and at that point, all you can do is wait. So Hugh stayed awake most of the night just watching. And I went to bed with our son Yul, our two year old, and I would still get up every 30 minutes, every hour to check because I can't sleep properly. You know, it was a very, that's why I can't sleep properly now. It's because of those nights uh, doing that, just getting up and checking that you're okay and checking that the fire is not coming. I mean, like, as we said, there's nothing we can do. It's just um, keep waiting. And if we, you know, the, the fire comes to us, then we should leave. So there's nothing I can do, just stay awake and just keep checking mm. if the fire is coming so uh, our uh, new year's eve and new year was like that yeah so just just waiting till 3 3 30 in the morning i just keep checking mm. i just went outside a few times and checking mm. if something burning if or, the, the flight you could actually see the um, flames coming It's starting raining. And still the fish fire there. I can't even see from the camera.
please don't stop the rain. Keep rain. So by that, I think I came out as well and I was like, it looks better. I can't see the glow as much. I think you should get some sleep. And if we, we can feel them, maybe we can just rip right away. Yeah. So we packed everything, our backpack and mm. everything. So if we were seeing flames, we would go yeah. down to the beach right away. And everybody else would be doing that as well. If there was literally flames there. Um, yeah, and the air was uh, terrible. Awful, as well. awful smoke. And uh, the thing that... Nicola said before, but uh, yeah, seeing this all the firemen and fire women, and they all like look quite old and young. And I want to say like the the fireys, we call them fireys in Australia, do an amazing job. Even though we're saying you know they're older or they're really young guys straight out of school, the ones that we saw in that area, they do an amazing, amazing job. I just wish there was more. And the neighbor on the other side. Um, she actually asked her husband, why don't you volunteer, you know, earlier? Why don't you volunteer and do and do this? And he was like, when do I have time? Like he had a job that could have traveled. And then that's the thing that because it's a volunteer thing, who are the people that can volunteer? Like the guys are the strongest in their peak or the women as well in their peak. Like they everybody, they can't, they don't have the time to do that. Yeah. The whole system of being volunteer and then relying on public donation is ridiculous. This was already being, the government had already cut things. So anyway, uh, back to our story. So in the early hours of the morning, uh, I've got some notes here that I'm looking at here. Um, it was a bit better. And then New Year's Day was just very strange. There didn't seem to be, we could see the smoke from the fires, but they didn't seem to be too close. So it was still another day of no power and uh, no internet, not knowing if my parents were okay um, and what they were doing. Um, and then later in the day, I managed to uh, walk uh, through the next town to, there's a lake there where I know that sometimes the reception's a little bit better. And there was a few people over there because people were getting phone reception there. And that's when I managed to do like an Instagram post and talk to my family and know that mum and dad, they tried to come and get us, but all the roads were blocked off and they couldn't. Um, and the next morning they were going to try. So we knew that, that hopefully they were coming in the morning to rescue us because we were stuck. We didn't have a car. And um, food. We didn't have food. Um, we only had a little bit of food. The next day we would have run out of food and the gas on the barbecue was running out. So we had no way of cooking food or anything like that. So it was a little bit worrying. Through all this, Yule had no concept of what was happening. Like, he didn't even realize that the TV couldn't be turned on. So I'm glad that he's young enough that he wasn't feeling much of the effects of actually how awful um, things were. He was still playing and he was fine. We went down to the beach in the evening as well and let him play a little bit. Okay, so it's now the evening of the next day still no power still no internet i managed to walk quite a while and get some internet and just update people uh, we have food kind of until tomorrow but after that we don't have enough food so we're really waiting for my parents to come back and rescue us um last night you didn't get much sleep right yeah because you were watching the fire but in the early hours of the morning it sort of died down a bit it wasn't as um the sky wasn't as red and you can see that the fire is over that smoke over there but we're over here so seems to be okay at the moment but we'll see This is second day and uh, uh, we'll see how long we can stay. We're just waiting for, uh, we are just waiting for Nicholas' parents to come. And um, still lots of uh, fire trucks coming this way. And 
Uh, yeah, it's kind of scary because I can see the fires um, uh, just beside uh, this way. Um, it's really scary, but uh, there's nothing we can do. We have no cars. Um, oh, don't even don't have enough food so we're just uh, eating the leftover um, so hopefully we can get out here uh, as soon as possible Appa, Appa, um, Appa, mm, Appa. Oh, good. happy new year guys we are still okay So the internet actually came back on late that night, right? You realized that the yeah. internet was back. Um, so the next day, so the third day of no power, uh, we had the internet at least. But our phones, we'd been having to keep turning our phones off, turn them on. That's why I wish I had more footage than we did, but we were really like trying to film a bit and then turning the phone off. And that was it. But uh, the neighbors had a generator and said we could charge our phones. Uh, so that was really nice of them. And you'll play with their kids mm. as well. So that was a nice moment. And <laughs> Yule is sleeping behind us. If you hear a snore, that's that's him. Um, and But the thing was, we were hearing that nobody was allowed in like to this area. So the roads are all blocked off and the police weren't allowing anybody in. They were only allowing people um, out because they were asking people to evacuate. Um, and so we're hearing that and... Mum and Dad had got there at 7 a.m. to try and get in, and they were kept being told, "No, you can't, you can't get in." Finally, they talked to someone that was a little bit high, higher up, and they said, "We're only evacuating people out," and like, they're like they can't get out. You know, they're like, "We're trying to get in to get them out." They have a a two year old; they need to get out. Um, so they had a police escort escort them into the town, this village. Like this is very small areas. Um, and they came and then they came and finally we had everything packed up pretty much to go. So we, we packed up the car, um, but we knew we'd be stuck, stuck in these lines for a while. Uh, Mum and Dad managed to come back in with a police escort because we're all trapped here. Yeah, Yule's in the car over here, so we're going to try and get out. There's really big lines trying to get out, so we're going to be in the car for a, a long time. But there must be a fire just over here because the planes and the helicopters are going very low this way. So it's best that we get out while we can. Um, our neighbours have helped us out over here, so hopefully everyone will be okay here. It's just a little bit worrying at the moment. So we were stuck trying to get out of this area for about four hours. So sitting on the side of the road, another family let us borrow their picnic blanket. You know, that was very nice. Everybody was so nice around us as well. It was one of those times of, you know, the nice elements of humanity. So finally, they started escorting us out of that area as well. And we drove through uh, bushfire ruined areas, which you'll be able to see here. <laughs> about all the wildlife all the animals that would have been in those in those bush areas in those forest areas um, and it went on for ages like that 
And one of the reasons why we had been stuck for four hours was because the fire had started further up as well. So even though they were telling everybody to get out of the south coast, we were limited because there were still more fires uh, happening everywhere. <laughs> from Canberra and Canberra is having some of the worst air pollution in the world at the moment I think the worst air pollution in the world and so we're so close to there so it was the air was awful there as well but we couldn't go any further like mum and dad had been on the road since 7 a.m and it was now evening so we stopped at a, a motel there next day headed headed to my hometown and the air cleared a little bit as we went we saw like you could see how dry everything is we saw like the dust uh, tornado thing as well happening. Um, so the air got a little bit better, but then we got to my hometown and it's 43 degrees. Actually, most of the towns along the way, 43 degrees um, in Fahrenheit. That's something over over 100 something in, in Fahrenheit. And we were just exhausted and felt sick from the heat. So even though you have the air conditioner going, like there's a limit of how much it, it, it can do. Um, so at this point really just felt like wanted to go back to Korea. Even if the air is bad in Korea, you stay inside with an air purifier. I'm having the experience like that we do in Korea. We are just sort of gobsmacked, like amazed, horrified that the only recommendation the government is giving people is to stay inside the air inside is the same as outside you can do that for a day or two but then the air is the same as outside so it's just like you know when they're handing out a few masks and that type of thing but this is a long-term thing with this smoke and that like the bushfire season hasn't finished and they're not putting in air purifying systems and they're not talking about that they're not talking about what the other options are it's just and i think this is sort of to do with australian culture when it's thing sort of too laid back and not taking things seriously uh, but as you know somebody that lives in a country that does get a lot of air pollution and all the things that are, are done to help with that i'm just like why are they not talking to seoul or beijing or somewhere like it's just this complete denial that this is bad when in canberra whole like the businesses and institutions were shut down because the air was so bad and I've never had the experience of waking up and choking on smoke like you're in your room you've already closed up the house and you're choking on smoke you wake up because you're choking on the smoke it's absolutely awful to get back to why there's so much anger at the government um and firstly if anyone dares to say oh don't bring politics into it Politics are part of everything. The fact that you can live or breathe or work or vote, your whole life is dictated by what politics are. Everything is political. And if you don't want to hear that, if you say to people, don't make it political, what you're really saying is, I don't want to have to face the reality that there's consequences that hurt people when I vote. The way that you vote can hurt people, but that's the reality. Politics affect everything. So the horrifying thing is we've known that this is going to happen. So climate change study from 12 years ago warned of this horror bushfire season. They even name 2020 as the year that things will start to get bad. Literally what they said is exactly what is happening. And the government knew that. Still deny. And they still deny. And that's that we have a government where so many of the politicians in the government are climate change deniers and they're still going on tv and stuff like the guy that went on tv in the uk and saying that climate change is not real and i think part of the sort of stress that i've had from coming from that situation seeing how much things have changed and how there is lack of resources and then i came back to uh this community in my hometown that haven't been as affected like they get to the smoke and the dust storms and that type of thing but they haven't been in a bushfire themselves and especially around conservative christians there's a real climate change denial 
and for us literally escaping bushfires and then you'll see these people that you know posting these things on Facebook about how it's not climate change and and this and I just the, what what is it what the is stress, the reason then? the stress from it so not only did I have the stress from our whole experience but the stress of seeing that is enraging like and all the people down the coast that experience this are very very angry at the government anybody that's had any experience that this is angry about this and believe in climate change and they can see it and then you go somewhere where they've been a little bit less affected and they're climate change deniers and it is enraging it you, the stupidity of people so i wanted to put something together that was more coherent talking about this but i'm just not my mental health is not great at the moment so it's been a little bit difficult and all this stems literally from this experience my mental health problems at the moment literally from this and we had a minor experience in the bushfires so, so think about the mental health issues there will be for people that had their homes destroyed that were literally fleeing the flames like this i'm already experience, experiencing that there is going to be a mental health crisis of the trauma that people have experienced um so i wasn't able to put together everything i wanted to say about this Sarah Wilson here has a really good um, blog post about it. So at this point when she was writing it, so I'll just go through a little bit of this at the moment. When she wrote this, 23 were confirmed dead. Um, it's probably more than that. So, and then we know now over a billion animals have died. And these are animals that are going to go extinct. Um, they've got no habitat left. Even the ones that survive, they've got nowhere to go. Everything is just blackened. This is key habitats of native animals native animals that are not found anywhere in, else in the world native animals that the government uses in their tourism campaigns to make people come to australia to bring in tourism dollars that they don't care about the great barrier reef is being destroyed they're still putting in the coal mines they're still relying on fossil fuels they're not caring about australia at all but they still use it to try and manipulate people to come to Australia to bring tourist dollars. It's absolutely heartbreaking and enraging. So I can't go into everything, but you know, not that long ago, former fire chiefs and safety chiefs, so 23 former fire and safety chiefs wrote to Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, requesting to talk to him about the effects of climate change um, and the catastrophic extreme weather events, putting lives, properties and livelihoods at risk and he refused to sit down with them to talk about this. The government has ignored countless warnings over three decades, and you can see all this, like everything is, doc is documented. You can see the evidence, this is fact. They've ignored all the warnings. They ignored the calls for large air tanker fleet uh, to, be come in, to come in. Um, even when the bushfire season was starting and all the fireys were saying, we don't have enough staff or they want to have other firefighters from other countries come in. And Scott Morrison said, no, they're fine. They don't, they don't need that. They've been calling out for help for months, for years, and the government hasn't done anything about that. And then he tries to say, nobody could have predicted this. You have the, the climate change scientists saying, this was going to happen. We knew this was going to happen. I'm the kind of person is a prime minister. So the Liberal Party in Australia is not liberal. They use that they use that name, but they are not a liberal party. They are right wing conservative. So that can be a bit confusing for people overseas. But the Liberal Party are right wing conservative climate change deniers. And people in his government have accused everybody of being lunatics. They've tried to ban climate change protests. They're trying to suppress. Um, independent body actually classified Australia's freedoms as now narrowed. We are no longer a free country like that. Our freedoms have been narrowed because of this government. Oh, and he was in Hawaii when all this was getting worse and worse. He went on holiday in Hawaii and only came back because everybody was criticising him with no real proper apology. You've probably seen online some of the things of him uh, not being able to connect in any meaningful way to people that have been devastated, grabbing the woman's hand 
I can't go into everything now, but you can see that online, this lack of leadership, his lack of compassion. So also this plays into the government's vested interest in the fossil, in the fossil fuel industry. So you can see all that if you want to look that up. So leading experts in the world currently making the connection be between coal and climate change and the fires. International papers around the world are talking about this and pointing this out. And still we have a government that is ignoring it. So internationally, it's being said, like reports are saying the, the blame is on the government's generosity to the fossil, fossil fuel industries. So in November, Scott Morrison argued there's no direct link between greenhouse gas emissions and the fires that are happening. So he refused to say that this is why it's happening, that we had extreme drought and then the temperature is rising and this is what causes the fires. And there's a lot of uh, misinformation around because the people that are climate change deniers are really ramping up their misinformation. And the fire brigade has been the one to try and shut this down. So the government isn't trying to shut down the rumors because they fuel them themselves. The fire brigade has had to shut down the rumors. So people will blame the Greens political party, say that, that they didn't allow off the hazard reduction burning and all this nonsense like that, which is not true at all. There's so much real information that you can see, but climate change deniers, you know, they're finding their own echo chambers in their own pockets like that. You'll see, you see people saying it's not a climate change emergency, it's arson, it's just people lighting the fires. Yes, in a bushfire crisis, there's always somebody that deliberately lights a fire somewhere, but even if it was only arsons, climate change is still causing these fires to be horrific. They are huge. So it's just this misinformation that is going around. This is all because of climate change and we know that, so please be careful about what information you see online. There's definitely people that are spreading misinformation like that. As I said, there's still so much more stuff I can't go into, like the government doing a political ad, trying to promote everything that they're doing, which is the bare minimum. They're doing the bare minimum. It's absolutely awful. Can't go into everything right now, but I just want to talk about a lot of people don't understand how bad the fires are. These are awful, awful, huge fires that are also merging with each other like I heard that people overseas were being like why don't you just put the fires out and then like we're trying to explain to people that you the roads are blocked because you can't go that way and they're like well, I don't understand the trees aren't on the road so why can't you go on the road and it's just trying to get people to understand these are massive fires and they're fires that are merging they're fires that are destroying everything in their path people were talking about the Amazon fires and the California fires this is way bigger than that Australia is being destroyed and it's just horrific and i don't know what it's going to be like in a year from now or however long how on earth they're going to recover from this my heart breaks and for us i'm so thankful that we have korea to go back to being intercultural family uh, but for people that are australians and then this is their home it's being destroyed it's and so many people lost their homes as well and so many businesses are gone and so many communities are destroyed and it's just heartbreaking that's why i think it's good to raise some money for these people mm. if someone who wanna donate some money for animals and definitely i think um putting the money straight putting the money straight into for help for animals for a lot of the rescue centers and that type of thing is a really good thing you can donate to the fireys as well i mean that helps but also remember that you're literally doing the government's job. You're paying what the government should be paying um, for that. I um, I don't know what I'm a person that who always complains. So I just want to do something neater. So I want to um, raise some money and we just have some... Maybe when we're back in Korea, we can do some fundraising. Yeah. Over there and... Um... And I, I say, yeah, I mean, people say Australia is, you know, a uh, rich country. Why do we need to have... Because of the government need that help. we have. Because the government is not helping. It's not helping much. They're talking about, talking about giving $2 billion for the recovery of this. They're giving $4 billion to the Adani coal mine up in Queensland that everyone's been protesting for ages. They do not have the Australian people interests at heart. It's a horribly immoral government and that's why everything is political 
And unfortunately, they're trying to stop people from talking about, they're trying to stop protests. Public servants aren't allowed to say anything bad about the government. I don't know what's going to happen to us because we're saying how bad the government is, but it had, had to be said. I mean, like my experience of all this um, thing is like really um, serious. Like, I mean, for three days, we just stopped there and you know no power no internet and not enough food with the baby two years old baby and don't know when the fire comes to you and can't really sleep where and, and our experience was better than a lot of other people people are still in that experience right now yeah. people are still going through that right now i'm yeah it was really scary i i know there are so many uh bad happening or someone who is the worst situation than here or whatever i mean there are so many um but we are just talking about this because mm. it's through our experience and mm. you know australia is my wife's country mm. so uh please uh pray for australia pray but also whatever country you're in vote in a way that is going to save our earth so we'll follow this up later i guess so if you do want to see more about this you know you can subscribe to us if you want to i will have some other videos about this probably because it is one of the biggest things to have ever happened we'll be heading back to korea soon and um honestly i can't wait to go back to korea because my heart is breaking here okay